Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, one of our news anchors for our live stream channel, which we're expanding. We're going to hope that this new year we're going to be, uh, with your support, uh, move into higher definition transmissions. We're also adding many people to our team, including Professor McKinney. Uh Tim, you're, you're probably the best analyst for military, geopolitical, uh, and uh, strategic issues. There's a lot of those going on, and... Uh, Tomorrow is not the end of the world. And by the way, I just got a report that something like 50, 60 minutes ago, quote, the end of the world started in the Mayan calendar in some part of the world because it's already the 21st, I think, uh, beyond the dateline. Uh, no, I don't see the end of the world happening. But, you know, they, they, they never said it was the end of the world. And, in fact, all no, the it's all, it's people all they interview that, that, that are experts in their, their heritage and their history say that's, that's it's just, also, it's uh, not, a Hollywood it's all, hype. It's, it doesn't it, it, mean no, that it, at all. I call them the modern minds. These are liars that want to use this hype. I've also had people, and I'm going to repeat this statement. Uh, one person emailed me saying, you said that Planet X is going to cross on the 21st of December. No, I didn't. What I did say is there are Planet X-type objects, including Comet C-2012 uh, S1, which is 25, 26 kilometers across, and we're going to pass through the tail in January. Millions of miles from here. It's not going to hit Well, we just had one that passed... Uh closer than the moon uh, a few days ago. Right, but then we also have this pretty large comet, 197 meters long. That's, you know, like 800 and some feet. It's a big comet. And that comet is going to pass less than 5,000 miles. Back in calculations before they classified it as, quote, classified back in May, it went from 100,000 miles out to less than 5,000 miles off the surface of the Earth. That's, That's not extraordinarily good. close. Yeah, and it means that they actually calculated back and maybe before it was even getting closer, there was a 1 in 100 chance of a strike. A strike of a comet of that size would cause worldwide weather pattern changes and wipe out an area of France the size of Luxembourg. So it's something that people should pay attention to. We're not dealing with, we deal with real issues like gun confiscation by the crazy government with the dictator-in-chief in the White House. We've got the fiscal cliff, which is totally manufactured to bring us toward destruction of the middle class by increases taxation and austerity fascism and then we also have what we call the Obamacare cliff and we have the maniacs pushing for a war with Syria where the Russians have countered by putting the Alexander or Iskander missiles in Syria and they're quite capable. I want you to expand on this and tell us about the military aspects because I believe the, the, the if you want to call it the checkmate by the Russians makes it extremely unlikely that you're going to see the so-called Syrian free army make the the, uh, the uh, Assad regime fall, even if Assad himself is killed, there's thousands of Assad supporters that absolutely cannot let the Alawites and the Sunnis and the Christians and the Jews are all making up this conglomerate of the population that's at risk from the Sunni-launched, NATO and American-launched attack and regime change against Syria. And it's not just Syria, it's Iran, it's all the stand republics affiliated with Iran, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, etc., this is a really, really this, big well, it's, it's to push a devil's on. brew of uh, of a nightmare that will trigger the third world war if if yeah. it uh, goes too far. Uh, you notice when they, uh, as soon as the Russian uh, ask Icelander or Alexander missiles were delivered, uh, yeah. they pulled uh, our uh, nuclear carrier and assault carrier groups out of uh, range. We uh, oh, that's a smart. It's not a smart. I think move. it was words, the Eisenhower. I think maybe its battle group and also it, it, a. Uh, yeah, a Marine and, 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 amphibious uh, you, uh, group with an assault carrier. We got them out of the way. That missile is absolutely deadly. one of the nastiest things out there. It has a yeah. Mach six speed, speed, six Whoa. times the speed of sound. Whoa! It, now, uh, how fast is six thousand? Say how fast is it? Now we're talking about six times what seven hundred and eighty-five miles an hour, something like that. Yeah. It it has terminal uh, guidance. It it can maneuver at six times the speed of sound. So we're talking Uh, about 5,000 miles an hour, totally maneuverable, totally evasive, can fly under radar, have no idea it's coming. By the time you know it's coming, you're saying, hello, Jesus. Pretty much. It's got a 1,550-pound warhead, uh, so it's uh, almost a ton warhead. (laughs) Well, it can be nuclear, it can be chemical, it can be fuel air explosive, it can be... Uh, that warhead will take out a, a supercarrier. 
any right, warhead so, that fast. So basically, in the military technology, I would say, just as a uh, bystander with a little humor, I call that the oops in terms of oops, we didn't think the Russians really meant it. They don't understand Russian psychology. They're not going to come out and tell you what they're going to do. They're just going to go checkmate. Iskander missiles are there. And the next step, I believe... Well, I'll tell you what. These missiles are normally carried in a long, armored vehicle two to a vehicle. So they offloaded 24 vehicles. That's 48 uh, missiles. We can't even hardly see them in flight. And... um, Basically, the, uh, our probability of taking one of them down is well under 10%. So basically, say, we can't I, stop them. Basically, it means if there's a shooting war, our carrier groups will go to the bottom of the Mediterranean with thousands of our Navy. And well, and, and it also harbor. means that, that uh, all the best uh, uh, green pine radar system and Arrow 2 uh, missiles, etc., that Israel has, uh, the Fiat air defense system that they have from us, et cetera, et cetera, uh, mean nothing because these missiles can get through anything right, none of all over even, Israel. Even if they nuke Damascus flatter than a pancake because it's in a bowl, uh, if Damascus just uses these alone, without any other weapon systems, they will destroy Israel and they can completely cover uh, the area of uh, of uh, the Turkish territory that's abutted against Syria, where they're trying to set up a no-fly zone. In other words, uh, 250 like the, miles is about the range, and I want to tell you that takes a big hunk of Turkey, but it takes all of, uh, pretty much all, all of uh, Israel. Yeah, so it's and, like the, and uh, a lot of American bases. Uh, yeah, you know the the Russians had sold these uh, a couple years ago to the Syrians, and there was intense pressure for them not to deliver them. Well, basically, they 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 had them on two very uh, powerful Russian uh, amphibious assault ships, and they kept them offshore. But as soon as uh, NATO uh, gave the final absolute approval to send Patriot missiles into Turkey and to be placed on the border with Syria. That very day, uh, the Russian ships pulled into port and they began offloading. And in less than 24 hours, our fleet was out of the out of range. Yeah, well, and, uh, and, and, and uh, at least our admirals have enough sense to get our boys out of uh, well, uh, out of I, range. I, but I like the dry humor of Seinfeld years ago, and I remember one of their skits was the soup Nazi. Uh, I would say oh, yeah. to uh, NATO, NATO and to America, no no-fly zone for you today. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's very easy to intimidate third-world countries, but Russia is not a third-world country. Yeah, they also had, don't have a third-world attitude. Uh, that's no, they why they're, they, they collaborate, even developing the S-400 anti-aircraft system, the MK-17, with China. Uh, they've they've licensed the uh, JL-17, which was given 50 plus to to Pakistan, which has said they're going to cover the back of Iran. They have the third largest nuclear weapons development facility in the world, which can make 60 to 100 new nuclear warheads of two to 300 kilotons per uh, year. Uh, the, you're talking about the Pakistani, yeah? The that Pakistani they actually in, produce thermonuclear. Uh, 50 yeah. to 60 thermonuclear warheads per right. year in that one right. factory. Right. So, in other words, uh, what we're dealing with is we're dealing with the forward edge of World War III. We're dealing with an India-Pakistani exchange, a China-India exchange, a Russia-China-American exchange, uh, a NATO exchange in Europe. I mean, this is good. And Israel will shower the Middle East, but Israel will cease to exist also. I yeah. mean, it, all, this is, uh, I'll, I'll tell you who wins. Satan, because he has a giant blood orgy of millions right. of God's children killing one another. Right. But so ultimately, I, as we know, his days are numbered on this earth. Exactly. That's why he's in a large panic. Absolutely. Amazing. The analysis is, no, it's not going to end tomorrow, but the future is bleak. Without the Most High God, as they say, your first prepper requirement is... Have a relationship with the Most High God because you can have bullets, food, and water. If you don't have God, you're done. Welcome back. And, uh, Jimmy, have some other news. You, you get into issues that I hear many other radio hosts and so on talk about and missing major issues like the Iskander missile or Alexander being deployed. 
You have a report here, you posted up here in the Times of Israel, Russian warship docks in Iran, and much more over in your blog, europebusiness.blogspot.com. Uh, let's talk about this for a minute, because I think the players are being aligned for the horse trading to bring about the mark of the beast. I think that we're going to have a stuttering regional war that hopefully won't get way out of control, because it means if we do have a cutting off of the oil, there very likely will be the death of a lot of people, and the cutting off of supply of oil will precipitate a worldwide depression, not just a recession. It lay the groundwork for the mark of the beast, which I think is coming. And, I, I would uh, argue we're in a depression, but what's coming will make what's happening right now pale by comparison. Let's call it a very depression. <laughs> <laughs> the greatest the depression, depression before, actually, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Gerald yeah, Lenente calls. Yeah, if, you, if you're depressed before, don't worry, it'll get worse. Uh, well, when gas goes to ten dollars a gallon or fifteen dollars a gallon, yeah, it, it could get bad. I, I, yeah, will it be temporary though? It may only last for a short while because what I, they ultimately want to do is they want to clench Europe and America as a clenched fist to force the whole rest of the world into the economic system, which is the European London banker style total hegemony. They want to force the entire world. Well, let's call them by America. their name. It's the Rothschild Empire. That's why we need to change the state of Israel, which is not really Israeli, because a lot of them are Talmudic Jews, which are Satanists, secular agnostics, bisexuals, and the etc. Rothschilds can there's care a small less number of Israel. real Torah Jews, and there's a small number of real Messianic Christians, and Arab Christians make up the most of the Christians in the state of Israel that are actually Israeli citizens. It's a very strange place. If you go there, you realize Israel is more secular, and they do more per capita abortions than any other nation on earth, including China. There's more per capita abortions in Israel than even in communist China. That's crazy. They also have in a very large number of houses of ill repute that are almost exclusively uh, staffed by uh, beautiful gals from Eastern Europe who are literally white slaves. They have been kidnapped or induced the large, to come for the, jobs. And, and the, the, largest number, the largest number outside the Arab kingdoms of Saudi Arabia, Qatar, etc., is Israel. Second to all these other nations with you know millions of square miles is a little t- nation of Israel where they have these houses of ill repute. I mean, it really is a haunt of devils and evil. You know, It says, I saw a woman riding the beast. That woman riding the beast is called you know, the harlot. Guess what that is? That is the current state of Israel. People don't understand that. They think, oh, Israel, as long as we maintain friends with Israel, yes, Israel we should defend, but we need to cleanse it too. Israel hasn't been cleansed by the blood, so they're going to do what's called the abomination that desolates, which means a U.S. president, this is by rabbinic law, will allow the rebuilding of the, of the Herodian temple, and they're going to start this abomination, which is a blood sacrifice in the temple mount. Well, they've already that's read the, 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 the red heifers. Uh, they, they have, have the kalal, uh, which is the ashes from the yeah. from the earlier temples, because they had to have the kalal, which they got out of Qumran. They have all the components and all the koanim and everything ready, including even the tent of meeting with the cow skins. They don't even need to build a temple. They can erect it overnight with those big lights. So yeah. they can literally start on Sakat or tabernacles at some future date after a treaty, because I believe this war will lay the groundwork for it, whether it's a neutralized Syria and, and Assad is gone, or a Syria that's been basically castrated. Uh, but it's coming. In other words, the peace there's, treaty is coming soon, real soon. There's uh, a couple things we need to cover before we run out of time here. Yeah, uh, We are, are seeing now, uh, globally, uh, for two years now, very abnormal weather patterns. Uh, the Russians, in some places in Russia, it's down to 50 below zero centigrade. Um, I, I, I can't do the, the Fahrenheit thing anymore, but uh, what other that is? It's, uh, well, 50 below, what you do is you subtract 32 uh, degrees and you double it. Okay, uh, what is yeah. that? Uh, anyway. It's 50, very, below, 50, very 50, 50 below centigrade is going to be real cold. We're talking about uh, down around like minus 30, minus 40. Well, I've been in, in, in Russia in winter, and they're very hardy people, and they dress for it, and they're prepared for it, but they're telling people to stay home. Yeah, actually, and, uh, and believe I me, when Cal- they tell I, you to stay home in Russia because it's too cold, oh, hell. <laughs> well, a, a good example of Russia is Alberta, Canada. Uh, and during the summer, it's very warm. It's actually warmer than California or a lot of places in the southern U.S. because you have such long nights. But in the wintertime, you get these woods called these Alberta Clippers, 
And any day after Labor Day, it can go 45 below. I remember running in Calgary when I was doing my residency in family medicine in the late 70s. And I remember running outside on the Bow River, and I started spitting out blood. Now, I'm not a smoker, so I was spitting up chunks of blood on the snow. I said, ooh, this is bad. And I started to feel tired. It's like I wanted to curl up and go to sleep. And I was running... I was running a real good mile. Like when I was in good shape, I could run a, you know, uh, at my very best, I was running a 4 minute 15 to 4 minute 30 second mile, which is pretty fast. But back then, I was out there jogging a little slower than that, probably about 5 minute mile. And I was coughing up blood. And when I got home, because there's nobody else running, I thought, this is weird. I heard the news report because I didn't check it before I went out. It was 68 below zero with the wind chills 115 below. You are lucky to have survived that. Yeah, I could have died there. Just there. To, I went over like a five mile run, and I came back and said, and I realized, oh dang! And all my arms and legs all of a sudden started to kind of open up the circulation because I was starting to get central shunting, and my arms and legs went like on fire because it's like, hey, there's blood flow now. Hey, this is cool. And all of a sudden, <laughs> oh, that doesn't feel good. I didn't realize well, I was actually getting uh, crossed by this. Uh, the, the point of the point of all this is this is directly related to the British petroleum oil disaster. The right. use of Corexit, Corexit and other dispersants which sunk the oil. Mm. Oil breaks it, up a warm water current in a colder body of water. And essentially, the loop current has been dead for two years now in the Gulf of Mexico. The loop current is part of the thermal highline circulatory system that operates uh, in the Atlantic Ocean, in particular the northern part of the Atlantic Ocean. It moves a great deal of heat around. It affects the atmosphere for up to seven miles and acts as a steering mechanism. Uh, the, the Gulf Stream itself acts as a steering mechanism for the atmospheric jet stream. But it's not warm enough because the loop current isn't feeding it all that energy from the Gulf of Mexico, so it's not acting as a steering mechanism for the jet stream, and the jet stream is continuing to act abnormal. And again, we're, we're seeing this really crazy weather patterns. It's been two years now, but mainstream news media will not make the connection. No, well, they don't want to. And you mentioned a number of points in your blog here. Well, the advent of winter to bring blizzard across the U.S. Uh, you mentioned 16 states. Kazakhstan freezes in a prolonged cold spell. They had this last week. Uh, 34 miles of traffic backed up between St. Petersburg and Moscow because yeah. the storm literally locked people literally in their vehicles that the storm was so bad. Uh, heavy snow expecting Armenia. Heavy snow They've had a similar event, by the way, in China. Right, and right across wow, northern China is, is crazy. Also, by the way, I noticed yesterday in the report I was watching in the news, there was a giant sandstorm across uh, Texas, and uh, yeah. I guess it was, I don't know how many dead, I think it was two or three dead, but they had a pileup of, you know, dozens of cars. So these, the kind of sandstorms are the kind we had during the Dust Bowl days, and the hydrofracking they're doing across the U.S., pulling the water out of the water table, is killing trees, killing plants, <laughs> and killing animals. Killing cattle in the field. Right, you can't pump that water out and hydrofrack it and put chemicals back under the water there and suck the water out of the water table because you stop transpiration, you stop the plants being able to the trees to have water to live. Crazy attitudes, crazy policies. Back in a moment. Welcome back, and um, Chris, you sent me this report from literally two days ago, NRC to further examine solar flare issues raised in rulemaking petition. Uh, it's amazing. Maybe we've embarrassed them today, literally asking better questions, realizing that, uh, as they say in the military, we're screwed and tattooed. We have not prepared our grid to deal with CMEs that could occur in 2013 or 2014. We have a narrow window to actually get the equipment upgraded. We're not dealing with the fact that station blackouts that occurred to three reactors, including Oyster Creek, Indian Point, and I think there's a third reactor you mentioned that just was hit by Sandy. These reactors, when they go into hot shutdown, are going to vent off tritium and other radioisotopes. People are just not facing the music that because they can't taste or smell it, it won't hurt them. They're wrong. Uh, this, these reactors are not properly being upgraded, safety tested, and, and war gamed out to see what will happen. Tell us what's going on. What happened in this report from the NRC, published two well, days ago? Well, you know, this is, um, th this is a result as uh, of a member of the public filing a petition, maybe listening to the show or not, you know, and, and uh, he had some concerns about long-term electrical grid outages due to solar flares. 
And, uh, you know, I know that you and I have been talking about it. Sure, it can take out the grid, and it actually has in the past. So uh, he said, well, you know, what about uh, these plants? Can we do anything to maintain uh, cooling at the plant in the spent fuel pool or something like that? So basically, uh, the NRC has decided to amend its regulations or and at least analyze that this has to be taken into account for licensees, the emergency plan. And so they're, they're going to have to do something to show that they can handle uh, a solar flare that may take out large, large portions of the grid for a long time. What it means is that, that basically your diesel generators may or may not work because the, because the solar flare may disable portions of even the internal, internal uh, transformers that are there. It depends on how much damage there is, of course. Or if, they, or if you can live on the diesel generators for, for a very long time, you'll still have to be able to supply uh, fuel to them and replenish that and have a plan for that, which, which most plants already do. But this may even be longer than we'd expect. You know, a lot of times we figure uh, 24 hours for a diesel generator and you might have off-site power. And well, that, that 24 hours may roll into several weeks. So, Ooh, that doesn't sound like a positive outcome. Uh, what we've learned, and you've been a major part of learning and teaching me and other experts we've had on, and Arnie Gunderson's reports that are put up on Fairwinds, we've learned that basically this old technology is embedded not just in Japan and multiple reactor sites, but here in America. It's around the world. There's a lot of Mark I, Mark II designs, steam pressure tubes like the one in San Onofre, bad technology. We've also discovered many of the places like Indian, Indian Point off New York are actually sitting on fault line thrust zones that 75% of our reactors are within what's called a strike zone of a major geotectonic event. We're not ready for any of this stuff. We have an upgraded technology. We don't want to put in the money. We're just going to pretend it's not happening. And the Japanese have gone way overboard. They're doing what I call national hairy carry. Hari kari. They're literally committing radioactive suicide by even spreading the food around, say, make sure you do your part for the nation by eating Fukushima fruit. <laughs> It's crazy. These Japanese need to get smacked up the side of the head. These men that are pushing this through the Japanese diet, which is a party. That's a funny term to call diet. Only it's a radioactive diet. That's the name of their parliament, by the way. I just want to just read a little bit more of this petition. That's kind of important. And I just want to just say, you know, the, the analysis, you know, the NRC did, did take this to heart. And they can't ignore it, as you said. And... Um, it's it's bigger than just one agency. It's also the entire, you know, uh, health of the grid itself. And I'll, I'll just read this one part that is kind of uh, stands out. The analysis, that's the analysis of solar flares, also considered existing research into solar flare effects on the grid, as well as protecting transformers and other critical grid infrastructure. That's the stuff that feeds the plant. In other words, you may you may not be able to connect the diesel generator through a transformer through. Um, and power everything you, you require to power it because that those may be damaged. You've got to protect a lot of equipment. You have to find a way to protect it. And yeah, exactly. along with ongoing uh, NRC uh, efforts to implement lessons learned from the Fukushima nuclear accident. So it, it does tie in. It does roll together. Right. Now, uh, the Mayan scam day, I call it, is tomorrow. But we're going to be left with a number of big issues, and I'd like to rank them so people um, because. My favorite show on television, I don't know if you've seen it, uh, Tim and uh, Chris, is Doomsday Preppers. It's the most scary, the most funny, <laughs> the most over-the-top. And some of the people, they always latch onto one issue like a barnacle. They go, yeah, this is my issue. I'm waiting for, you know, the uh, uh, you know the super volcano to, to blow in Montana, you know, at, at, uh, at Yellowstone. I'm waiting for a tsunami from the Cumbre Viejo and the Azores. I'm waiting for biological and chemical terrorism in New York City. So the last show they had last week was Escape from New York. It's like a movie. And it's scary but funny because you see people asking rational questions. A lot of them are just doing basic prep to see if I can even just get out of the city because it'll be like it'll be like uh, cockroaches trying to crawl out of a bucket with gasoline on fire in the bucket to some of these cities. I tell people the very first rule is get the hell out of the big cities now. No matter where you are in the world, be on the outskirts or in an outlying region, if you have to throw, travel into work, you better be prepared to not live anymore in the center of any big cities. I don't care where you are. If you're in New York City and you're trying to be a prepper and get out, uh, when things get really nuts, how likely do you think it is you're actually going to, your chances are of getting out unscathed? You might get out, but it may be, as the word says, scathed. That's not a good term. Um, 
Number one. Number two, we have real disasters coming. There's going to be a problem if the concurrent financial conditions continue. We're probably going to get a devaluation of the currency. We're also going to probably get a major spike in food prices because of gas hall with Obama pushing his green agenda. With him still closing coal mines, we're going to see increase in power rates. We're going to see an increasing war in the Middle East with very likely, because they're burning out our military and troops, they're very likely if this war expands a lot, they're going to call for a draft in the next couple of years. And... Um, you know, people say, well, that can't happen. Yeah, of course it's going to happen. If they keep expanding these wars, they're burned out our current troops. What do they expect? They had more people dying from suicide than even from IEDs now from Afghanistan. So, uh, and of course... Yeah, I've known people that have been there like four times, five times. Right. right. The, by the way, 21% of the U.S. population are on what I call the kill-you-jack drugs. That's what I call the whole range of drugs from Luvox, which Cleveland and Harris were on, to Prozac, I call kill-you-jack, to all the other drugs like Celexa. These drugs disinhibit you. Say, hey, if it comes up in your mind in this dream state, hey, it's a good idea to commit suicide, by the way, before you do that, let's kill a couple dozen people. <laughs> and all the markings on this kid were, if you look at him, he looks like a cartoon character, uh, Adam Lanza, because you can see the whites of his eyes around his entire eyeballs. You can see his shirt pinned up to his neck with the top button closed. You can see his hair is combed down. He looks like a mushroom kid from Mario World. Uh, well, he had, not, he had three things going on, Doctor Bill. He had yeah. first off, he um, uh, he was a goth. He was a goth, though, right? He was a, in the goth culture, which right. a large percentage of those people are devil worshippers. And, and, and by the way, the Asperger syndrome would not by itself it would actually make him pass no. without these crazy no. drugs. No. He had a depression or other psychiatric illness, and they were about to put him in hospital. To me, one that was the second thing was the drugs he was on. Yeah, and they want, and they've closed the, re, the thing because they don't want to tell you that he's probably on an SSRI drug and maybe an antipsychotic, God knows what else, it would de repress And the third thing he was doing with all that, Dr. Bill, is he was a heavy player of uh, very violent computer games. Now, let so me he's explain about computer games. programming himself to kill people. I, I talked to the senior teachers at Air Force Academy in the early 1980s when they were contracting to Atari. Their big concern, and I talked face-to-face -face with the senior uh, trainers there at Air Force Academy, which is like the West Point for our advanced pilots, as they said, <clears throat> we don't know if we can turn off the kill reflex if we put these Air, uh, Air Force trainer equipment in the simulators in our academy. Uh, and what they, these are now all over the place. Now you got Call of Duty and you get all these other war games, and they're so realistic. And now every time these kids do these and do a kill and then the replay reset, they're getting a little burst of dopamine. Now, I call this, in a sense, uh, what I call uh, mass murder pornography. It's the same way as you get a dopamine surge when you look at pornography, okay? That's why people get erectile dysfunction after they look at pornography, because they don't get as much dopamine with their partner. When people are like this, the only way you can get high now is you got to kill a bunch of people in real life. And by the way, the biggest high is now the police arrived outside, time to pop your brains out the back of your head with a bullet through your roof of your mouth. They're electronic drugs, and we got to realize that's why these games are dangerous. And we're back with uh, Chris Harris. Chris, uh, 2013 is likely to see uh, the increased risk of uh, 7.3 just two weeks ago in Sendai, Japan. Increased risk of a major break not only in the containment there at that site, but also in pyrophoric fire at one or more of the reactor sites or cooling pool, it's very likely we're going to be seeing other reactors, including OI and uh, Hamioka, will lose control. And we know the magma chamber of Mount Fuji is full and ready to blow, which means it's in the radius of destruction of all of these plants in northern Japan, in Honshu, and it's very likely we're going to see in 2013 a catastrophic increase in northern hemispheric radiation. January 6th last year, 2012, almost one year ago, there was a major uh, earthquake and a release of radiation from one or more of these reactors, probably MOX Reactor 3, which is the one making the mixed oxygen fuel plutonium pellets, which are, by the way, a advanced nuclear thermonuclear weapons development plant. That's what it was, even though they'll lie and tell you otherwise. And that radiation was detected not in the United States or Canada or Britain, it was detected not in Western Europe, but in Eastern Europe, where they, believe it or not, coming out of the Soviet Union and out of the fall of the, the so-called Berlin Wall, 
they actually told the truth that, oh, well, by the way, it's radioactive, but it had to get you know 10,000 miles from here to Japan to cross the Northern Hemisphere, not over the pole, but around the entire world in order to get to Eastern Europe and show that there was high levels, not just of regular isotopes, but the really bad stuff called plutonium. And it sounds horrifying because guess what? It is horrifying. It's taken such a long time to establish any kind of effort to even think of uh, cleaning it up and containing it. And, and I've, I've been driving home. Containing it is not going to be easy to do. And we just saw... Just, well, uh, I, we, we, we can think out of the box. We, the first thing, and we, we both talked about this, is we need to make a solution that is a solution of a brine and boron so you can have a boronated brine to actually create a crystal structure to kind of lock it in. Number two, you need to actually build a corium catcher underneath it, so you need to use tunneling equipment to create a corium catcher. You need to create what we call depleted uranium containers. You could slide in sideways under there, weld them together, and have a pump system to literally take water that's highly radioactive, which is pumping through there to keep these reactors cool, and then turn that into a solid waste and take it away in double-hulled ships to a tin mine thousands of miles away in a safe uh, manner. Uh, this is a very expensive project. This is going to cost hundreds of billions of dollars to fix. And if they don't fix it, it's going to continue burping radiation in major minor burps for millennia. This is a scar on the planet Earth, and that radiation will be sneaky. You may just find, oh, the abortion rate's higher now, spontaneous miscarriage rate. Or, hey, look at the amount of neural tube defects. Or, look at the number of people with Alzheimer's disease or cancer or heart disease surging as the radiation surges out of Sendai, Japan. The Japanese are in a catastrophic mode right now. Any woman trying to get pregnant in the northern hemisphere, uh, the northern side of Japan, downwind of uh, Fukushima or downwind of the plants where they're burning this radioactive waste all over Japan now, which is craziness, are absolutely insane to get pregnant. You know, uh, don't get pregnant. That's my advice. Don't get pregnant. And don't do an abortion either. I'm talking about use of non- Abortifacient, non-birth control means of birth control. For God's sake, women should realize this is dangerous. Get the hell out of there. Move to a southern island and petition your local politicians not to burn radioactive waste. This waste should have been taken rather than averaging it, put in containers and shipped to the bottom of a tin mine somewhere. But this idea of just burning it, this is a crime against humanity. It's globalizing radioisotopes that were in buildings and other material they averaged inserted it back in the atmosphere and it's blowing over us so when we're sitting around looking at the nice weather here in southern california we're getting radiated from idiot policies from these japanese i'm not happy about it uh, th this this is something that we're all we need to learn from this and, and prevent it yeah, from happening else and you can't go into a kind of like a stubborn denial state where the the strange culture of the japanese says you know you have to do national uh, retribution, you must eat Fukushima food, you must share the suffering of the Fukushima people, you must have your children destroy their DNA with radioisotopes, and you must not grumble, you must not tell a doctor it's radiation, because if you do, we won't see you as a patient. They're actually doing this right now in Japan. It's like, how obscene can you be to tell children that it's the national duty to eat radioisotopes, and when they complain that their teeth are falling out or they're getting sick or getting bloody diarrhea, or they're all of a sudden now have leukemia or some other horrifying problem, that you're just complaining, and if you mention that it could be due to Fukushima or radiation, the doctor is not in. The doctor won't see you. you That's know, what's actually uh, happening. You know what that sounds like to me is 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 uh, a forced suiciding of a large part of the Japanese population by their own people. Right, so I would say in non-Japanese, you citizens of Japan must suffer with Fukushima. You must commit national radioactive harikari. You must commit genetic harikari. You must destroy your future heritage. You must be happy and smile like good Japanese. And if you grumble, we will not see you. That's really nice. That tells me that's, uh, crazy. that's a really that's a that this part of your culture. You Japanese, you need to dissect this out with a laser and throw it in the trash. Stop this foolishness. And anybody over there, there's a lot of people too that are, that are Western, or Americans are married to Japanese. You got more clues. You understand this. And there are a lot of Japanese that are getting really pissed off with this because they're not stupid. They're some of the smartest people on the planet. They're looking at this and saying, our government, 
are evil. A lot of people don't want to use the word evil. Uh, Tim, you're, you're a good expert on evil. I, evil is the word live backwards, so it's a good way to think of it, living backwards. Well, it, it, when, when you are looking at a government that's supposed to protect its people and instead is, is doing the opposite and something so dangerous as six nuclear power plants with seven uh, fuel storage pods that are enormous, uh, and uh, this, this nightmare has gone on for over a year now. We've got literally a China syndrome with at least one plant, and uh, I mean, they're literally uh, fiddling while Rome is burning. Their, their children are dying, their old people are dying, their in-between are dying, and they're literally destroying a large part of their nation and is going to be polluted for longer than any of us will be here times a hundred thousand or, or so years. It's it's insane. And and if that's not evil, I don't know what is. Yeah, now some people say, Well, in my day and here's what I think. The modern Mayans are basically trying to traumatize people psychically, so number one, they don't believe in biblical prophecy. All these prophetic garbage and all these television networks and books, by them large, talks about the new age and everything. I think everything's going to be great after December 21st. Don't worry. There's going to be an ascension. You're going to join like Hale Bop. You're going to, you're going to be the Heaven's Gate people. You can, just commit suicide. You'll feel good afterwards. It's, <laughs> yeah, right. It's like, this is nuts, okay? And the fact is, I also have idiots that don't listen to the whole show or all the shows that say, oh, Deagle, you said there was going to be a passage on December 21st of the, of the, uh, uh, dwarf star, whatever. No, dwarf stars, comets, asteroids, nearest objects. We already have two that we know are real dangerous. They're going to pass very close to the planet, and there's a hell of a lot more. One just two weeks ago that was whipping past the Earth. What was it? Fifty thousand miles off the Earth, or, or less. It's like one fifth the distance to the Moon. These objects, by the way, have a debris uh, trail with them, and if we have an asteroid storm, if you want to call it a meteor storm. You're going to see the little streak across the sky is in yellow, and then you're going to see the whole sky go flash as you see thousands of these show up, and then all of a sudden the sky is going to turn reddish with the debris, and we're going to have a big problem. And of course, well, the historian in me uh, keeps wanting to scream: uh, uh, "Calmets are harbingers of death, destruction, and war." And we already know that in 2013 we have two enormous comments that should be visible during daylight hours. One in March right. and one uh, about November. Yeah October. yeah, October 3rd to November, yeah. And that doesn't include, by the way, the one in mid-February that's crossing my birthday, 197 meters. These other ones are real big ones. According to, to Professor McCanny, although the NASA people are saying 25 to 26 kilometers, that's big. It's a lot bigger than the one that, by the way, caused the death of the dinosaurs. Um, that one was probably around five to seven miles. This is like five times bigger. That's big, okay? So um, we're not going to have a, likely a strike, but what's likely to happen is that this comet is likely to pass the sun as the tail passes the moon somewhere in the fall of 2012, 2013. We're very likely to see in the next two years a major CME that if they don't harden the grid, immediately the most vile and nasty thing will happen is their grid's going to go. Now, our civilization is, cannot switch back to the agrarian culture. If the grid goes, you don't just have no iPads, no iPhones, and no fancy little electronic toys, and no Internet. No, 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 no. You're going to have humans become literally the zombie apocalypse become real. And by the way... Well, it'll be a real problem burying the dead. Yeah, well... Yeah. And the other, by the way, the bioweapons that the Syrians and Iranians have for the biopreparat rat includes... A zombie pox, if you want to call it, an answer, sorry, a rabies type virus that eats the cortex of the brain and turns human beings into living zombies. It's real, it's not imaginary. <laughs> <laughs> 